Good morning. Uh, before I even say a word, I like to start us off with a word of prayer. So join me in prayer. Dear Holy Father, thank you for giving me the opportunity to minister from your word this morning. As it has taught and impacted me so greatly in all aspects of my life, I pray that it will do the same for those that hear it this morning. For those of us who have gone through or are, or are currently going through a tough time in life, especially about not getting a solution to the situation at hand, I ask that your word will minister to these individuals and give them hope that you will give them an answer and speedily. As I've been reminded, everything is done according to your will, not ours. And like a good parent, you know what's best for us to receive the solution to our needs at the right time. Help our hearts to be receptive, our thinking to be clear, our minds to be open to your instruction. Help me to speak from your word the way you want me to speak today. These things I ask in your name. Amen. Good morning, folks. For those of you who don't know me personally, my name is Charles George, and I attend Loft here along with my wife, Lena, and our two kids, Amaris and Ryan. And we've been attending here at Law for about 11 years, and I would love to meet with you afterwards if I don't know you, because I really do love to get to meet new folks and establish relationships, and to make sure that you guys feel welcomed and included. Now, just a little background on me before I get started. If you don't know, I'm in the informa information technology field. I am a senior project manager at Southwest Airlines. And if I have met you, but I haven't talked to you in a while or in ages, I would love to reconnect with you. Because like I said, I love relationships and I love building rapport with folks because it's really something I cherish. However, regardless, it really is an honor and privilege to speak to you all today. You know, I never thought in the 11 years that I've been attending here at Loft that I would actually be standing here and giving a sermon. Now, today's sermon, and more specifically, the passage that we're going to dive into, really has taught me to learn to trust and be persistent in reaching out to our Heavenly Father. And to share it with you all really makes me thankful for this opportunity. Now, going into this year's preaching cohort, I selected the passage that we're going to dive in today because I really, really had to dig deep to quote up popular phrase that I've heard in the sporting world. However, I would have never expected to take the journey that I've gone through these past few months in shaping me and reminding me of God's truths. This journey, to say the least, has humbled me beyond any difficulty that I faced in the past. And it made me look through new lenses on how I approach my struggles. Now, as we look together in the passage today, Luke 18, 1 to 8, sorry, titled in most of our Bibles as the parable of the persistent widow, I want you to be reminded that in your journey of this life, you will face various difficulties. And if you haven't already, you will. And if you have, I assure you there's more to come. Either way, it's a guarantee that difficulties, struggles, hardships, are a part of life, no matter which way you look at it, whether you like it or not. These difficulties, these struggles, these hardships will involve questions that seem to have no answers or problems with no solution in sight. However, I encourage you that no matter your struggle, pray and do not give up. I'm going to say it again, and I would like for you to say it with me that no matter your struggle, pray and do not give up. I want you to think about that and ponder this statement as we dive into the passage today. It is simple enough to stay, say and even memorize, but it actually is really hard and harder to go through and in essence, not give up. So with that said, I want to pose to everyone in this room a rhetorical question because that's what everybody does in a sermon, right? What comes to mind when you hear the term lose heart? Merriam-Webster defines lose heart, not loose, but lose heart, 
as to begin to feel that one cannot do something that one has been trying to do, to become discouraged. Now, sure, we can all relate to this term in some sort of way. We all have, are going through, or will go through situations in which we will lose heart. In fact, in today's world, we communicate our grief, our losing of heart, in different ways through conversations, social media, taking it out in an activity, and even in prayer. And it doesn't matter whether or not you're a Christian, Christian, and non-Christians fall into this category or situation, this dilemma. Regardless of your age, your status, your skin color, your socioeconomic background, your occupation, or whatever category you can define does not label a person or exclude a person from this dilemma. I know for sure I have gone through this. Taking it a step further, I know that there have been times through continuous prayer, my cries out to God have seemed insane. Now, by insane, I'm referring to the popular but not correct definition of insanity that is attributed to Albert Einstein, doing something over and over again and expecting a different result. Now, if you take this popular definition and, you re and reading this passage that we're going to dive into this morning, the average reader may say that the widow, which we will read about, is insane because she is constantly asking for justice. But nothing has changed in her situation. In fact, you may have felt like that widow in your life. In fact, you may currently feel like that widow in your life today. And although this feeling and what people see in front of them looks gloomy, there is hope. There is an answer at the end of this situation, this scenario, this journey. So with that said, I want to start off by reading this passage, Luke 18, 1 to 8. And I believe it will be shown behind me um, and I'll be reading from the ESV. And uh, for those of you that don't have your Bibles with you, you can follow along behind me. And starting in verse 1. And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Now, as we read this passage, we see that there are three characters in this story. A judge, a widow, and an adversary. And for those of you who don't know what an adversary is, because I don't want to assume, it's a fancy word for an opponent. It's the opposition. It's an enemy. First, we have a judge. A judge in the times and the context of this passage was known to be crooked. And if you look at verse 4, you can see the judge has apathy. Apathy being another fancy word for lack of care, doesn't care. For the widow and her situation. Commentaries on this passage have shown that this judge would not have been a Jewish judge, but a judge appointed by Herod or the Romans. In that respect, they would be notorious. I mean, evil is an understatement there. Going a step further and reading in the Greek, this type of judge wouldn't be honorable. They would be referred to as a robber judge, someone who's supposed to administer justice but is just plain wicked and really abuses their power. And if that isn't enough, the judge's selfishness in this passage, honest annoyance from the widow, getting persisted 
describing how he feels about the widow's persistence, is translated to stun or bruise the judge. Again, because of her constant nagging, her persistence. A person of a high and powerful position is being worn down because of a widow's need for justice. Second, we have the widow. Again, in referring to the times of this passage, a widow's security after the loss of her husband would be her son if she had one. Of course, if there was no son, it would be way more difficult for her. You can describe her situation as the cliché, have her cards stacked against her. We can read in other passages of Scripture that widows like the one I have described come under God's protective care. They are not to be oppressed, and anyone who takes advantage of them or oppresses them would be punished. The widow is someone in this passage who is clearly at a disadvantage. Finally, we have the adversary, or in some translations, opponent. Now, not much given is in this passage about the adversary, but we can be certain that this person was definitely stronger and more powerful than the widow in this story. This adversary may have had physical tools or prominence or other power structures to hold down the widow in ways the widow would not have a fighting chance. Of course, times are different compared to the times in the Bible now, but the evil intent of impression can take many shapes and forms in which the oppressed, whether it's back then in the Bible or now, has to reach to a being or power that is greater than the oppressor. You might be thinking this is obvious from the outside looking in from reading this passage, but if you think about modern times in your life, you have or will go through the same thing too. You will be like that widow. And is not just restricted to fellow human beings, like a bad boss or another physical human being that you and I can see, but circumstances and situations that make us feel incapable of standing toe-to-toe -to -toe of what is across from us, like our finances, our health, school, job. In fact, sin. Sin is a perfect example that seems like a powerful adversary that keeps us down. In fact, you don't have to use the examples I just gave. You can fill in the blank. You can think of any situation where you need justice from your adversary. Now, if you think about this passage or the situation in your life that is very, very similar, you may ask, well, what should the widow do? Well, I'm going through a tough situation now, Charles. What do I do? There are three things that I want to present to you today that hopefully will help you and more importantly, point back to God who is faithful, especially in our struggles. Number one, don't stop crying out. Number two, seek Him. And number three, keep moving forward. Number one, don't stop crying out. Number two, seek Him. And number three, keep moving forward. These points may sound very, very simple on the surface, but I ensure you, when you are going through your struggle, when you're going through your fire, it really is tough to do. And I can speak that very honestly and humbly. First, don't stop crying out. We can see in the first verse, always to pray and not lose heart. This is a command from Jesus himself that is very, very clear. I say this very humbly because of what I have gone through in my life and what I'm going through. I would venture to say that in times of teaching, when you hear passages like this, this command is very easy to absorb, get in our head and, and nod our head, yes, I believe, amen, agree. But again, when you are in that situation, when you're in that fire, it becomes a challenge. A lot of us can cry. But can you cry and pray? On top of that, can you cry and pray and not lose heart? It's hard. 
However, this is a command because the Lord knew what battles and obstacles you and I would face in our lives. Your lifeline is to cry out and pray. Does that mean you always get what you ask for? No. In fact, we have heard many speak here that God hasn't given the person what he or she has asked for in prayer. Most of the time it was revealed much later in a person's life that this was a blessing. And when I say blessing, I am not referring to strictly receiving something tangible or like an object like money or a positive event like a promotion at that job or even getting that dream job at an awesome company, or even getting into that elite school that you were dreaming of since you were young, or being with the person of your dreams. In many cases in our, in our Christian walk, not receiving those things are in itself a blessing. I can tell you in my life that this is the case. We have to be reminded that God knows our needs, our situations, our desires, our dreams, before we have even asked Him. And even though we do ask God through prayer, we have to be reminded that prayer is designed to accomplish His will here on earth. His will also means changing you, changing us, changing I through His power. You may ask, like myself, should we persist in prayer and continue until we get an indistinguishable answer? I love things that are black and white. I hate the gray. I'm a computer science major. You either get it or you don't. There is no in-between. What about the statement that God will avenge speedily to those who call to him? Are we dealing with the judge like the one in the passage who will get worn out and just say, okay, okay, Charles, I get it, I get it. You've been asking for like how many years? Here you go. Here's the answer. Here's the solution to your request. Now leave me alone. I have a universe to conquer. You've bothered me enough already. I have another seat apart. So here's your stuff. Go. No, we have to understand that if our request in our situation is right and in line with His will, if it is just, if our prayer is our submission for God to do something, it is to do something beyond that we can imagine. We have to remind ourselves. In fact, I have to remind our, myself, even when I was preparing this sermon, that we cannot think of our prayer as informing God of something that we need that He doesn't already know about. As I've stated before, He already knows what we need. He knows our situation. He knows our desires. He knows our dreams. Whether, whether or not we think it's good, He knows. We have to be convinced that He loves us just like a good parent. He is my heavenly Father. As I have read and researched for this passage, for this sermon, I've gone through my struggles of getting through situations in the past, currently in the present, and I know I will face them in the future. The common thing, the common theme that keeps standing out when I was, when I was researching this passage, and as one commentator put it very, very well, God's chief concern is my eternal good. Notice I stated eternal good, not temporary good. God's chief concern is for my eternal good, not my temporary good. That eternal good is our waiting period, that God is doing something. And yes, folks, again, I will repeat, that eternal process feels like eternity when you go through it. But like all of us, including myself, and I will say it repeatedly through this, we have to be patient and let God do His thing. His thing includes changing 
us through his power. Second, seek him. Just as the widow kept coming to the judge, we are, we are to come to our father to seek him earnestly, daily, repeatedly. Please note the passage is not saying that the judge is like God, is like Jesus. In fact, there is no parallelism here. There's no parallels. In essence, this is a contrast because our Lord is not an unconcerned, unjust, uncaring judge. He is, he is the one who loves and cares for us, and more importantly, concerned about us, no matter how hard that is to, that is to believe at certain times in your life. You may believe that in your head when you hear a message like this, and it may sound like no sweat. But again, when you go through that fire, what happens when your persistent prayer requests turn from seconds to minutes? Minutes to days, days to weeks, weeks to months, months to years, and so on. And like me, you may have asked, um, God, have I not made myself clear on what I'm asking? What's going on? What do I do? What do I do? What do you do? You seek him. How? Reading his word. Understanding and believing his promises, praying to him, even when logic doesn't seem to work out. Listen, I will say this again. This is a message for me too. And I wouldn't limit your journey or seeking of God through your tough times, your adversity, your struggles as an individual journey. In fact, I would talk and reach out to your friends who are grounded in the word, especially those that have struggled. And if you don't have any friends or you don't know anyone that, has, that, that is grounded in the word, that have actually struggled, ask me after service. Talk to Sam. This is not a PSA for you to talk to us because we know that God works through a lot of us. But I, I, but I will repeatedly say that it is important that you make sure that whatever struggle you're going through, make sure obviously you talk to God, but make sure that you let someone else help you carry your burden. It is really, really important. Talk to those that have, that have been grounded in the word. Reach out to them. They can give insight. They can tell you what they have experienced. And for those of you who know me really well, I have always made an attempt to check up on folks to see how they're doing if I know that they're struggling. Not because I am the know-it-all, that I'm perfect, because I know. I have done my best to share with some of you how God has helped me in my tough times. Those times of encouragement were always meant to help and point back to God who always hears us. To put it another way, it's amazing to learn from those who have struggled with an issue to have God come through against their adversary. The common breakthrough in life's toughest situation or toughest situations has to be the seeking of God and His providence and Him being a judge that advocates for us. For those like myself who are seeking Him, Remembering the testimonies and the breakthroughs that God has done in life that helps us to be reminded and to help others who may be like that widow, who are grasping at the straws asking for justice. Those testimonies and those breakthroughs bring to memory of how people were changed in their situations through God's help. Lastly, Keep moving forward. Yes, there are times it seems to us that God is deaf, that He doesn't want to answer our prayers, that He doesn't care. One of the lessons that I have learned in preparation for this sermon is that prayer is needed 
to change us. Not God, and at times, not the situation that we're dealing with. Being persistent in prayer transforms us to be like God himself and opens our hearts and our eyes to focus on things that are important to God. This can vary from situation to situation, but the exercise is needed as a gradual change to form us in God's character. That change is what moves us past from the place we were at before. And that move should move us forward and not backwards. I can definitely speak from experience, and I'm pretty sure that many of you all as well, it's very seldom that that move, that that change, that that victory in our situation is quick. And most of the time, it is a very long and sometimes in our eyes, eternity, that process will take, seems like it takes forever, but it is designed to keep us moving in the right direction. Like I said, I, you know, I love quick answers to the questions that I ask, quick resolutions to the issues that I'm going through. You know, the prayer request that I have, I ask it on Monday, I should get it by Wednesday, 5 p.m. at the latest. Doesn't always work out like that. But taking this approach in the spiritual realm, as I've learned, will not produce the changing character to our lives that are needed. Charles Spurgeon said in, on prayer that too many prayers are like a boy's runaway knocks. It's given and then the giver is away before the door can be opened. Now, if you didn't understand that quote or the context, it's something which I admit I have done when I was a lot younger, going to neighbors' houses, knocking on the door, running and hiding in the bushes, and waiting for the person to come out and open the door and say, hey, who knocked on the door? Nobody was there. With that, this way, the person that comes to the door like us, like the little boy, who's someone who knocks on the door and runs. Sometimes we're like that when we're in prayer asking God for a solution to our situation. We become impatient, not wanting to wait. And instead of moving forward and being persistent in prayer, we don't move. Or worse, we move backwards. Moving backwards is not a change that you want. Even though your struggle is in front of you, you, you don't want to regress and fall back. And worse, quit and give up. In fact, you should move closer to God, to Jesus, because the changes you need, more importantly, make you stronger and in Him. I want to add an important note here in what I've said. And many of us, including me in times past, have ignored the simple command of praying about our situation our problem, our dilemma, our opponent, our adversary. And yet, this is the most important command that we read about, starting in verse 1. There is never a time we should stop praying. Many times we try and figure out our situation with our own wisdom. And the last question ends up being asked, did you pray about it? Did we pray about it? I know because I have done that too. But if we remember what our Lord said in the first verse, we would heed this command because it helps us get through our situations. In fact, it is the faith that he's looking for in verse 8. As we look at our situations that we have overcome with God's help, in which we were victorious, the situations that some of us are going through now, which have changed us to conform us to God's desires, we can actually look at Look at those situations like puzzles. Now, for those of you who are into puzzles and like putting those pieces, whether it's a hundred or at times to me it seems millions of pieces to construct an awesome, wonderful picture of a puzzle, and I can tell you that I don't like doing puzzles, I want to challenge your thinking on this. If we can trust a puzzle maker that every piece of the puzzle we are physically working on is vital, 
or in other words, contributes to the picture you see on the box of the puzzle that you are working on, why can't we trust God that every piece of our life puzzle is vital and necessary for our lives? Every struggle, every adversary, every opponent is important to shape us, to, to let God make us and mold us in who he wants us to be. Think about it. You know, as I've talked, I want to share with you guys some, a couple of, couple of experiences where I had my adversaries, my opponents, where I was crying out to God like that widow, where I needed justice against my adversary. My first experience was my SATs. Now, first of all, for those of you, um, for those of you who know or understand, and as many of you have gone to four-year colleges or are in college right now, you know that one of the biggest entry requirements into college is taking a standardized test for most of us. Now, one of those little tests is known as the SATs. And a little background on me on standardized testing and SATs was that I was not a very good test taker. I just couldn't do it. But this is what I needed to take and score well in order for me to go to college. With that said, I took my first SAT test near the end of my junior year in high school. I did the best that I could, and knowing that I struggled with these tests, I assumed that I would get a 1600 on the exam. Back then, a 1600 was known as the perfect score for an SAT, and I don't know if that's the case now. Thank God I don't take those exams anymore. But also, one of the rewards is that you would get your picture in the paper. You can obviously see what my ultimate goal was. Well, I took the exam, and I waited a while for the result, and I got it. A disappointing 720. Yes, you heard that right, 720. While all my classmates were easily breaking 1,000, it says, how could I have gotten more? I couldn't even break close to 800. I tried again that summer, and approved only by 10 points, 730. I'm like, what? This can't be right. I'm also a bit nervous. I'm entering my senior year at John Foster Dulles High School in Sugar Land and haven't even submitted my college applications yet. Well, I got to take it again. And you know, there's that saying, third time's a charm. So you know, obviously, this is it. It's the beginning of my senior year in high school. And while every one of my classmates is talking about, yeah, I'm going to go to UT, I'm going to go to a and No, I'm going to go to Rice or SMU or Baylor. I'm thinking, how in the world can I get into those schools when I can't even meet the minimum requirements for SATs to get into college? Like I said, I got to take the exam again. And one thing I want to point out back then, and I don't know if the stats are true now, but there was an important statistic that if someone were to take the SAT more than three times, he or she would not improve. The stats showed that. I took the exam again. I got my result, and it was a disappointing 770 points. To say that I was bawling at that result was an understatement, especially when you grow up in a culture like mine you know that most Indians would never even dream of getting a thousand. Of course, I was the anomaly. And I was really, really shocked. On top of that, I already started applying. And due to my situation back then, it was best for me to stay in town and go to the University of Houston. I got my result of application from U of H, and it was a rejection. What was I to do? God, I have got to go to college. You got to do something. You know my situation. During the Thanksgiving holidays, to say the least, I was salad. I was not salad, sorry, saddened. We had salad for Thanksgiving dinner, obviously, but I was saddened. I was stressed, but fortunately, I was reading my Bible one night in my room, and I came across a verse in Mark, Mark 11:24, which I consider my testimony verse. According to the King James Version, it says, Therefore, I say unto you, what things soever you desire when ye pray, Believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. And as soon as I read that, I'm like, okay, 
This is what I need. I cried to God like the widow that night because at that time I need justice against my adversary, against my opponent. I study the best I could. I reapply to UH as best I, I could. I take the SAT again. I did the best I, I could. I get my result back. Did I get that 1600? No. But I improved to an 860. I have hope because I, have, I, I sense something is moving. I hurry up and take the exam again for a record fifth time. And I ask God for help. At the same time, I am waiting anxiously for my result of reapplication to the University of Houston, hoping that things would change. It's the Christmas holidays in Houston, and I remember that day like it was yesterday. It's a cool Saturday afternoon, and I'm watching college football, and then obviously I go, okay, let me go check the mail, and I see two envelopes addressed to me. One is from the SATs, and another is from the University of Houston. Now, to say that I was nervous and my knees buckling at that moment was a complete understatement. I'm perplexed because I am like, which one do I open first? I decided to open the SAT one and slowly pull it out. I look at the score section, which is what I have here. Now, contrary to what you all see, knowing how brown and tattered this is, this is not the Dead Sea Scrolls or Paul's original letter from prison. This, yeah, before email, those of us, those of us had to wait. I couldn't get on our phone and hit F5 to refresh. What's the score? We had to wait. And lo and behold, I improved. I see, and I know you guys can't see it, I improved to a 900. And if you remember what I said earlier, the stats show that no one was to improve after the third time. How was I able to? God helped this widow. I am happy with the result. I also have that other envelope. I slowly pull out my UH letter. With anticipation, I pull out the letter, and it states that I've been accepted to, to the university. How can this be? It's because of God, my judge, making a way. The second experience is me landing my first PM position. As I stated earlier, I am a senior project manager, but the journey to get to this point was filled with rejections, with the capital R, and disappointments beyond the eye can see. I know that 99% of you weren't part of this church back in 2010, but in that year after I gotten my project management certification, known in the industry as the PMP, I had my mind set on getting a PM opportunity. It should be easy, right? I have the most infamous letters after my name in our industry, so it should be a piece of cake. No. From December 2010, I applied. I tried. And I cried through endless rejections. Whether, whether or not I got the initial call to come in for an interview or getting to the very last stage and losing out to someone else. I went through it. In every sense of the word, I cried to God asking for help. This is what I studied. This is what I wanted to do. Why wasn't anything working out? And I was persistent in applying, trying, crying, praying, hoping that the next position would work out. It didn't. It hurt. It hurt bad. I asked God if I was doing anything wrong. Why wasn't I getting my justice? Why wasn't I getting the victory? I looked at the spreadsheet where I kept track of everywhere I applied, and it was getting very lengthy on my rejections. And after about 15 months, I get the opportunity to apply at American Airlines. As a consultant PM, I go through the process, the interview. I'm cautious. I don't know what to think, but I go through it. I finish. I sit and wait for them to get back with me. They finally did. The short of it is they decided to pass. The loneliness that I felt after re getting rejected again for the millionth time, it seemed, was something I will never, ever forget as long as I live. Never. To say that I was hurt and helpless could not even scratch the surface of how I felt. I felt like I was dealing with an adversary with no hope in sight. In my mind, I cried louder and longer than the widow in all her days and nights 
where she cried out to the judge. I was asking God, why? However, two days after I got rejected, I get a call back on March 27, 2012 from the same folks that said I was passed over. They decided to create a position for me and asked me if I was interested. I remember where I was sitting in my workplace when I got that call. I was shocked to say the least, and I asked like a skeptic, are you for real? Is this a joke? The guy laughed and said, no, it's not. They were thinking about my application and thinking about me and decided to create a position and wanted me to come on board. I would have never thought that this, is, that this situation would have ever materialized in something that I pursued so greatly. December 27th, 2010, all the way to March 27th, 2012, I cried like that widow. I had a righteous judge granting a widow like me justice against an adversary. In all these events, the glory, the result, the blessing, the justice points back to God's faithfulness. Me getting the result and what I was praying for was a byproduct. But more importantly, I was changed. I want to be very, very clear that we should seek God, seek Jesus, our judge, over and above our adversary through prayer. I say that humbly because of our human nature, especially in what I am going through now. It applies to me first. But I want to make sure that if you are currently in a situation like myself, Humbly consider what I have stated out of love. Please do not interpret what I have told you as a prosperity gospel mentality. For those of you who don't know, there's so many definitions to it, but it's basically, God, I gave you this, now bless me a million dollars. No, it's not that. In fact, the God that we worship and serve, he's not a genie. In fact, the gospel is not only supposed to change our situations, it's supposed to change us through those situations. The victory, the solution, the victory points back to God. Through, though your journey is hard, as I stated earlier, that no matter your struggle, pray and do not give up. Don't stop crying out. Seek Him. Keep moving forward. If God gives you justice against your adversary, praise God. If you don't see justice, maybe God is wanting to change you through that situation. I say this humbly. Accept it. I know it's hard. And I say that in all honestly, very, very hard. Let him do what he needs to do because it really does point back to him. His glory and what he is trying to do through you. You know, I've said a lot of things, and I want to end in prayer. I know that the praise and worship team will come up behind me. But I've, I've hoped that this passage, that this message encourages you. I know that a lot of us are going through some things right now. It, it seems like it's more than we can bear. And obviously, we can't compare our struggles, but it obviously tugs at our heart. I encourage you to keep pressing forward. Keep crying out. Seek Him. If your situation doesn't change, ask that God changes you through that situation. Let me close in prayer. And afterwards, our praise and worship team, Sam, will take over. But Father, thank you, Lord, for giving me this opportunity to come to minister th through your word. Thank you, Lord, for being a righteous judge. Thank you, Lord, for showing your concern, for caring for us, even though there are many times we feel like that you don't care. I know that I felt like that, especially in the past few months. I pray, God, that you will give all of us strength, the ability to hold on to you. Give us the desire to seek you out through prayer, through your word, and I pray, God, that whatever help happens, help us to hold on to you. Thank you once again. I'm praying for all of us that are going through some struggles right now. I pray, Lord, that they will be victorious, that they will be changed, but more important, 
importantly, it will give glory and honor to your name. Thank you once again. Thank you, Lord, for giving us hope. I give this all to you, and to your name I pray. Amen.